The 1930s saw the rise of Nazism in Germany. And with the elevation of the German Chancellor Adolf Hitler to supreme dictator, war was not long in coming. September 1st, 1939, Hitler's forces invaded Poland. The Blitzkrieg had begun. Nazi panzers were on the move. Crack Wehrmacht divisions, along with overwhelming air power, soon decided the issue of who was going to rule Europe, at least for the short term. Polish forces were pulverized by the mechanized might of the German juggernaut. This was the first war in history where deliberate terrorization of civilians was carried out as a matter of policy. With all of Europe subdued, Hitler now turned his attention towards Britain, and for a time, England stood against the might of the Luftwaffe entirely on her own. With barely 700 fighter pilots to counter nearly 3,000 enemy fighters and bombers, they raced aloft to meet the German aerial onslaught. Throughout this campaign, the German bombers were of the light to medium class, capable of carrying no more than four to 5,000 pounds of bombs per plane. But considering their numbers, were it not for Britain's fighter force, the Nazi aerial blitzkrieg might have been successful in opening the way for a cross-channel invasion by the German Wehrmacht. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor brought the United States into the war as an active participant, fighting on two fronts alongside Allied countries. Hitler dreamed of a Third Reich that would last for a thousand years. But what he gave the world was a nightmare that lasted for well over five. The war caught the United States woefully unprepared, and it took months to get the army up to strength, not only in manpower, but the necessary hardware to fight. The arsenal of democracy went on a 24-hour shift, turning out war material for the Allied cause. Steel for tanks and armor, guns, large and small, to put on them, as well as rifles for the troops. The one Axis miscalculation in deciding to draw America into the war was an undervaluation of the awesome power of U.S. industrial might and seemingly unlimited capacity. Fortunately for the U.S. Air Forces of the time, the 1930s saw the implementation of a bomber program that produced the XB-15, a prototype heavy bomber that would result, within a few months of the onset of war, in the famous B-17, the ship that would bear most of the brunt of the bombing campaign in the skies over Germany. Flying by the hundreds from English bases, the U.S. 8th Army Air Force used these ships to lay waste to most of the German right. With the Americans in B-17s by day and the English at night in their Lancasters, German transportation systems and war factories were pummeled into rubble. In the Pacific, the U.S. was plagued by a lack of a long-range bomber to carry the war directly to the Japanese homeland. Bases in Russia could not be used because they were only at war with the Nazis, not the Japanese. Chinese bases were out of the question, at least temporarily, because most of the country was already overrun by the Japanese. campaign to retake the Japanese conquest was necessary to acquire air bases forward enough to reach Japan. 
and in the meantime, a new long-range bomber was developed to fly from them, the B-29, which came into service near the end of the war. The B-29s were finally able to pound Japan from a few crude clandestine bases far behind the lines in China late in the war, but these were on the fringes of feasible bombing range. Meaningful attacks would have to wait until enough far forward bases in the Pacific could be acquired. The B-29 was a big ship and capable of carrying more than twice the load of a B-17, but it was still far from a truly intercontinental bomber. When it first came online, the B-29 seemed the ultimate high-flying bomber. It had a pressurized cabin and flew at altitudes most fighters of the time had a hard time reaching. This B-29, the Enola Gay, carried the ultimate horror weapon of World War II, the atom bomb, which it dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The threat of more of these weapons finally persuaded the die-hard Japanese to see reason and to, in the Emperor's words, endure the unendurable. The Japanese surrender followed immediately. Fat Boy, one of the bombs dropped on Japan, produced such carnage that it was almost impossible to imagine the devastation much larger bombs in the offing might produce. Thermonuclear hydrogen bomb needed a large plane, one that could reach any country in the world, deliver its cargo, and then have enough fuel to get back home, or at least to reach a friendly base. The B-36 was to be just such an aircraft. The origin of the ship can be traced back to the early days of 1941, at a time when it seemed that Britain might fall to a German invasion depriving the USA of any European allies in case of war, and in particular, leaving the Army Air Corps without any bases outside the Western Hemisphere. Consequently, the Air Corps felt that it would need a truly intercontinental bomber with unprecedented range, one that could bomb targets in Europe from bases inside the continental USA. Clearly, the brand new, still on the drawing board, B-29 was not going to be capable of that. The first XB-36 was rolled out on September 8, 1945. It sat on massive single 110-inch diameter main wheels, which restricted it to only three runways in the USA, which had sufficiently thick concrete to support the weight of the aircraft. Six engines were each to drive a 19-foot three-bladed Curtis propeller in pusher configuration. The engines were to be accessible for maintenance in flight through the seven-foot thick wing route. XB flew on its maiden flight on August 8, 1946, remaining in the air for 37 minutes. It was the heaviest and largest land plane ever to fly up to that time. However, there were problems with the wing flap actuating system, engine cooling was poor, and turbulent airflow off the wings caused propeller vibration, which adversely affected the wing structure. The aircraft's overall performance fell below the original expectations. The range was too short and the speed was too low. Six fuel tanks with a capacity of 21,000 US gallons were incorporated into the wing. The 163 foot fuselage had four separate bomb bays with a maximum capacity of 42,000 pounds. Debate. 
decided to stick with the basic B-36 as a special purpose nuclear deterrent bomber. At that time, it was thought that 100 B-36s would be enough, and no further procurement was anticipated. Like the B-29, only the forward crew compartment and the gunner's weapon sighting station compartment behind the bomb bay were to be pressurized. A pressurized tube between them was to allow movement of the crew to opposite ends of the ship. The B-36 flew quite well on just three engines out of its possible six, so theoretically one could lose half its complement to flak and still continue the mission and have a safe return of the crew to base. maximum speed and for a too long takeoff run. On October 5, 1948, Convair proposed that these problems could be addressed by the fitting of two pairs of turbojets in pods underneath the outer wings. These turbojets would be used for takeoff and for short bursts of speed during the bombing run and would only have a minimal effect on the range. consist of five 37 millimeter cannon and 10 50 caliber machine guns. These guns were to be distributed among four retractable turrets and a radar directed tail turret. A 25 inch diameter 80 foot long pressurized tube ran along inside the bomb bays to connect the forward crew compartment to the rear gunner's compartment. Crewmen would use a wheeled trolley to slide back and forth. Germany had early on in the war developed V-2 rockets and experimented with jet aircraft, although the latter came along too late in the war to make a difference. Air Force planners had a whole new situation on their hands with the onset of the Cold War. It now became vital that the B-36 be truly intercontinental in scope. They had to imagine a scenario where the Soviet Union would be capable of overrunning all of Europe, much as the Nazis had at the outset of World War II. In that case, U.S. bombers would have to be able to take off, hit their targets, and return to their bases in the United States. Meanwhile, the U.S. jet program was just getting underway. consisted of 15. Pilot, co-pilot, radar bombardier, navigator, flight engineer, two radio men, three forward gunners, and five rear gunners. Four rest bunks were provided for relief. Another priority became airfields and runways that could accommodate the B-36's enormous weight and provide enough space for it to take off and become airborne. The war in Korea brought home to the Americans the immediate dangers of the Cold War. The U.S. Air Force was instrumental in helping in the fight against North Korean aggression. 
While the new American jet fighters went into action, the B-36 maintained the guard against the Soviets making any direct incursion. Having China come in was bad enough. B-36s could stay at their bases on guard against any Soviet move. This was the time that the Strategic Air Command developed its famed readiness. Crews trained constantly for the event everyone hoped would never come about. thermonuclear hydrogen bomb. Many times more powerful than the two dropped on Japan during World War II. And it wasn't long before the Soviets had it also. This was a nuclear nightmare of the first order, but it also provided a hefty impetus for the MAD concept. This was really going to be mutually assured destruction if another large-scale war came. And not only for the primary antagonists, as Albert Einstein warned, it was now possible to envision the destruction of all life on the planet. A series of early warning radar stations was built across the farthest reaches of northern Canada to watch for Soviet bombers. Inside the North American Air Defense Command, or NORAD, deep inside a mountain in the western U.S., plans were developed for any number of contingencies, including that of an accidental touch-off of World War III. Tensions ran high as both sides waited upon the other. What would they do under a given set of particular circumstances? Every little blip on the screens caused a mini alarm. The West had bases and early warning setups all around the world. So did the Soviets. Hotlines were set up by both sides in order to communicate with each other and with commanders in the field at the highest level to avoid an accidental startup of a nuclear conflict. Plans, procedures, codes, etc. were put into place. Means were available to contact everyone involved at once to verify possible orders coming down the pike. Frequent drills raced for their planes. Seconds could count in times like these. The B-36 was the subject of a lot of criticism. It had been accused of being as slow as the old B-24 Liberator of World War II and far more vulnerable. It had been claimed that even under the most favorable conditions, it would take up to 12 hours to get a B-36 aircraft ready for flight. Still, the aircraft was capable of very long-distance flights. safe point would be almost but not quite within range of the Soviets early warning stations. This was to be a policy kept in place when the newer jet-powered B-47 and B-52s came online. The whole process was well documented in the popular motion picture Dr. Strangelove a few years later into the jet era. Sooner than one would come down, another would take off. 
At the failsafe point, the pilots would then call back to base in code to receive up-to-date instruction on whether to turn back or keep going to their previously assigned targets. To partly offset its slow speed of 303 miles an hour, Convair put into place its earlier proposal for fitting out the B-36 with turbo jet pods on outer underwing hardpoints that shortened its takeoff time and boosted its in-flight speed to 435 miles an hour. Not all of them received this expensive modification because by the time it came, the B-52 was on the drawing board, destined shortly to replace the aging B-36. U.S. Air Force would continue to modernize its fleet with jet aircraft. The new B-47 medium bomber would augment the B-36. The U.S. would be relying heavily on these new atomic forces to deter the Soviets, as conventional forces were reduced in strength. It is truly difficult to imagine the colossal size of the B-36 until you can see human figures next to it. Jet assist pods under each B-36 wing was an idea that would also be grafted onto the Hercules transport much later in time, although their placement would be on the fuselage rather than the wing. Here, one can see the inboard trolley system in use for moving to opposite ends of the aircraft, as well as the tight, cramped quarters of the relief bunks. The sack flights meant that crews were aloft for hours on end to and from the fail-safe points, and the trip was very wearing on the crew. Each crew dreaded the day they might have to open their Bombay doors and drop their lethal cargoes on a target. By the early and middle 50s, air bases that could accommodate large aircraft like the B-36 were in place all over the United States, and the concept of long-range intercontinental flight was well established. The B-36, back in 1949, had established a distance record without refueling of almost 10,000 miles. Using the polar route to targets in the Soviet Union, this assured the aircraft of having enough fuel to make it back to friendly territory. Bombardier had at his disposal a new radar-controlled bomb site that made high-altitude bombing accuracy a certainty. Another interesting variant of the B-36 was the FICON, or fighter conveyor. This project was an early 1950s attempt to extend the range of fighter and reconnaissance jets by having them operate as parasites from B-36 bombers. A modified F-84E Thunderjet carried a hook on the upper nose ahead of its cockpit. During flight operations, the F-84E was to fly up underneath the B-36 and use its hook to engage a slot in the cradle. The F-84 would then be flown close to the target, where it would be released on its reconnaissance mission. It would then be recovered and fly home attached to the bomb. The old B-36, designed in the waning days of World War II, was to serve America's air power interests well, right up until the time it was replaced by the B-52.